Well, it looks like folks are coming in the door. Welcome, welcome. Come on in, pick a seat, sit down, get comfortable. We appreciate you being here. It's good to see a lot of familiar faces, some new faces. So please come on in and get comfortable. We're just gonna give it a minute just to make sure we get as many folks in as possible and then and then we'll get started. So just one more minute. All right, wonderful. Good to see everybody in. I hope you're doing well today. Sun is shining, a little nippy out, but the sun is shining. Spring is spring is on the way. Welcome, welcome, welcome. All right. Welcome everyone to the final event in our Provost Distinguished Speaker Series for this ac academic year. I'm Gladys Crusaint, Vice Provost for Strategic Initiatives at UConn. The Provost Distinguished Speaker Series is an annual event where we invite our recently appointed Board of Trustees, distinguished professors, and endowed chairs to share their scholarship with us. The Board of Trustees Distinguished Professorship is the highest honor that the university bestows on faculty who have demonstrated excellence in teaching, research, and, ser and service, and in doing so, elevate the reputation of UConn. One of the best part, parts of this award is being able to feature incredible scholarship and to give the community an opportunity to listen to the change-making research that is happening here at UConn. We are really pleased to highlight some of the great work we do here. I want to thank President Rodenka Merrick, who is also the Chair Professor in Sustainable Energy in the Departments of Chemical and Bio Biomolecular Engineering and material science and engineering for being with us here today. As we all know, Dr. Merrick is serving as our interim president, leading our university of over 30,000 students across five campuses. Previously, she has held positions as the vice president for research, innovation, innovation and entrepreneurship at UConn and UConn Health, and as the executive director of UConn Technology Park and Innovation Partnership Building. Under her leadership, new research awards to UConn and UConn Health doubled, growing from 184 million in FY 2017 to 377 million in FY 21. In terms of President Merrick's vast scholarship, she is a world leader in technologies for clean energy and sustainability. She has significantly advanced understandings of material and catalyst and has developed innovation uh, innovative manufacturing processes involved in fuel, sec fuel cell technologies, storage material, and electrochemical sensors for health applications, leading to high performance, commercially viable clean energy systems. Her scholarship work has resulted in more than 300 articles in referee journals and conference proceedings, 21 book chapters, and invited review articles in major journals one book published and two books under preparation. She also has six issued patents and 11 published patent disclosures. President Merrick brings her technology background in materials and energy to create, manage, and lead innovative program designs to commercialize new products and develop emerging markets that utilize advanced materials. She has expertise in integrating, um, integrating emerging market needs with technology capabilities to define vision and strategies of scientific organizations, building and leading diverse teams, prioritizing programs for market development, development and commercialization, 
in managing diverse scientific and engineering project portfolios. Dr. Matt Merrick has also received num numerous awards for innovation and leadership development in Japan, Canada, and the um, United States. She is an elected member of the Connecticut Academy of Science and Engineering and a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science. She has an extensive and diverse funding portfolio, including grants from multiple funding agencies and contracts with both domestic and international industry partners. Um, President Merrick is a passionate researcher, mentor, and teacher who has really dedicated her life to expanding STEM opportunities for students by promoting student place, I'm sorry, promoting placement of students with startup companies such as in UConn's technology incubation program and in UConn Health Laboratories through the Partnership in Innovation and Education program. Student success and advancement is always at the forefront of her mind as she continues to participate and support task forces that deal with important issues such as mental, mental health and student well-being. Her breadth of experiences and knowledge is vast, part of the reason we're excited that she is here to talk with us today. We wanted to make sure that we ended this distinguished speaker series with a bang. So per President Merrick is here to explain the intersection between climate change and nature, an important topic in today's world. And with that, I introduce you to uh, President Merrick as she speaks with us about climate change and envisioning a tomorrow in harmony with nature. President Merrick. Thank you, Gladys, and thank you, Michael. And uh, just before we went online and being uh, live or whatever, I told everybody I promised to have fun. So everything that we do, we have to do with a sense of joy and humor. And whenever I think of fun, I think of Michael's performance and I wish we are on the stage and we can be in person, but I will try to do my best, best online. So. Uh, I will start with saying that I'm really grateful uh, for opportunities that I have at UConn for 12 years. I moved to UConn in my early 40s to be faculty. Uh, and my goal was to uh, help uh, young people in, uh, in uh, thinking that the potential doesn't have the boundaries, that you, you should free yourself in enjoying who you are and discovering who you are. And I'm a believer in lifelong learning. So I believe you can only learn when you surround yourself with, with people around you and young people, especially because um, they will share a lot of ideas about the world and how they see the world. They will challenge you. They will, uh, they will, they are resilient. They are adaptive. And being the teacher is the best joy that I have by being at UConn. So I'm going to talk a little about, um, and um, I will ask people to advance my slides because of the videos that we have, but I want to acknowledge amazing staff that we have. And the first image of Sakura was created by Beta Nijaviti, who helps me with putting presentations. And she knows how much I love Japan, how much I love the Sakura, and how much I love being artists. So I apologize for not starting uh, Bleeding Blue, uh, today, but you know, Sakura is a beautiful season in Japan and whoever went there and experienced is something that I treasure for the rest of my life. So I'm going to talk a little about me, about climate change, innovation, biometric design, green hydrogen and fuel cells. And here I'm in the slide with my student, Alana, who was my undergraduate student and she's now doing PhD with me. And I have a great joy in um, in seeing students that are passionate about climate change, that are passionate about environment, and they are looking for the solution. And uh, we have to tackle uh, the issue from different perspective and the world that we are going to leave to the young generation is very important and dear to my heart. So if we can, uh, if we can move to the next slide, please. So my globe, in my background, you know, I always tell people I'm lost in translation. Uh, my my late mother was Austrian. My my late father was from former Yugoslavia. So I grown up bilingual. I was curious child, but I was always wanting to see things differently, and uh, I was never afraid to think out outside of the box. And um, 
I want you to have uh, experiences and with experiences come taking the risk. So I went to high school in Switzerland. I went to undergraduate school in Belgrade University, graduate school in Japan. I worked for Toyota Motors in Japan, Fine Ceramic Center. Then I moved to startup uh, at NGMET that was program manager for development of the fuel cells. We grew a company from four to 154 people, sold that company. Then I moved to work for National Research Council of Canada that has a huge cluster on the clean energy, green hydrogen. And in 2010, I moved uh, to Yukon as a tenure track full professor. So I had a lot of uh, publications by the time that they moved to Yukon, but Moon Choi at that time was dean and he says, we don't know, can you teach? So you have to be tenure track full professor. Are you okay with that? And I says, absolutely. I'm always taking the risk. And uh, that was a risk that I took. So besides of that, you know, um, I was the in the leadership training in Canada and US for two years. And I have the green belt in uh, lean manufacturing. Um, and I'm executive coach uh, from Toyota Motors since 2008. So what are my guiding principles? Um, you know, I always believe that in order to innovate, we have to think out of box that what brings us success is creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship for the better tomorrow. Um, and through ability to think out of box, uh, we embrace unknown and we address, uh, you know, how do we see ourselves and how do we see the world? Uh, so this is a picture of me in 1994 in Japan when I was a graduate student. It's in the journal called Boundary. And what I talked in that article is about the boundary and stigmas in the society. I talked about the boundaries in the science. I'm sitting by the scanning electron microscope. I was talking about resistance between different elements in order to address the energy, but also talking the way how we think and see the things. And uh, when I was student in Japan, I was first woman in school of engineering that was admitted to PhD program. They asked me why. They says the women do not go for PhD, that I should better stay at home and take care of my husband and children. They tried very hard, but I convinced them, you know, that this is about me. It's not about my gender, and this is where I want to be and what I want to do. And I also promised them that one day I'm going to leave Japan, but I'm always going to stay ambassador for Japan. And the moment that when I says I'm going to leave Japan, that's when they decided to let me in. And for me, the goal was not to be the first one. For me, the goal was to be at the door and let other people in. And by the time I graduated, there was six other uh, female uh, students in the program in School of Engineering. Um, so at that time, as every young person, I was very passionate about climate change. I think the world is ending in 90s because of the climate change of the old hurricanes and all the tsunamis and all the earthquakes. So I was one who works on the activists on the Kyoto Protocol that was adopted in 1997. And on the picture is the Kinkakuji Temple in Japan, Golden Pavilion. And I always thought that the nature created so many beautiful things and men uh, made that and that we should protect that. And uh, the goal was to uh, reduce the emission of the gases that contribute to the global warming and, and reduce six gases emission in the 41 countries that are developed. And after the Kyoto Protocol called, called the Paris Agreement that we went out and we are back. So, you know, it, it's important to have the big picture, but my big picture started 30 years ago when it comes to climate change. So the next slide, please. So the climate change is, is something that is real. So if you can just advance one more. So I want to show them the globe. And this is a slide that I was showing in 2005 in Canada when I presented to Prime Minister of Canada at that time uh, about uh, the this, the uh, the ice cap that has melted away, and in 2005 it was 20 percent that melted since 1975, and uh, we really have to take 
climate change uh, as something that we are going to lead to generations. And, and what I mean, this is the issue that we had to deal uh, 30 years ago. We are still dealing, but there is so much work that needs to be done because the way that we are heading uh, we are going to create a lot of problems in society. So next slide, please. So what will happen? Uh, the NASA data revealed that most major aquifers depleting faster than they recharge. And if you work, the, if you look the map, what can, what can you see is that water shortage, the crop failures, the rising sea could create tens to hundreds millions of climate refugees in the coming decades. And I don't think we talk enough about the climate change refugees. And this is something that we are going to uh, face. If you look what is happening with the wineries in France, uh, they don't produce any more wine in France. And now England is producing wine. Good for England, but bad to, for France and the rest of the world that depends so much on that. So next slide, please. So where are we with world energy and world energy consumption? So the global energy demand had grown 50% by 2030 from 2000, and China, India account for 45% of the growth of the growth in global demand. On the Asian demand, the oil and gas output will still remain the biggest suppliers in, by 2050. So renewables are going to make about 27% of the 2050 global energy mix. And, and that is very hard to change because of the, of the global economy in the world that we live in. So next slide, please. So where is the, you know, how that goes green gas by sectors? You heard our students protesting and saying, we want you to do something. We want you to stop producing electricity on the campus. And this emission comes from burning coal. Electricity contributes to 28%. This emission comes from burning coal and natural gas to make electricity. And it's responsible for 28% of, of the green gases emission. The rest is transportation, 22 industry, 11% commercial and residential, and 9% agriculture. So in order to address the climate change, we have to look for the mitigations and adoptions. Next slide, please. So I want to talk about manufacturing as well as biomimicry or approach to innovation. So seeking sustainable solution to human challenges, we need to emulate the nature's in adaptive way and sustainable way. And we have to go back in the nature when we design and look for inspirations because nature solved many problems that we are having hard time as a scientist to figure out. So I put the bird and then I, I, I look the JR500, uh, the fast speed trains in Japan, and you can see that this is design that they had when it comes to airflow and how to design to have the least resistance and gain the speed, the lighter materials, and, and how to progress. Uh, so next one, please. Uh, so this is uh, this is the building in Zimbabwe. Uh, so the building is called the East Gate Center. Uh, and it was designed, the architect has a goal that he wants to uh, design the huge uh, mall, but without air condition. And imagine what that means for Zimbabwe. So he says, I want to build a building that is inspired by, by termites and how termites build the buildings. So on the left, if you look the termites houses, they can go as 30 feet high and they are built of the clay or soil. So the, the materials that they used is a concrete and high thermal mass uh, materials, so it can absorb a lot of heat. So during the day, it can go to around 90 degree. During the night, it can go to 30 Fahrenheit. But inside, you keep all the time 60 degree without any air condition. So think about what termites do, what kind of the materials they use, and how we do adopt these materials. I just sent this image to our architect, Laura, and I says, look this, because 
if we mimic the nature, this is what we can do and we can live without air condition. Next slide, please. The another one, this is in Namibia. It's the southwest of Africa. And if you look the battle, the Nabil Desert battle, it because of the way how it tilts the body, when the air flows and wind, it produces the moisture. And the moisture goes all the way to the down to the mouth of the bee, and that's how the bee gets the water. They use the same concept to create the seawater greenhouse in Oman. And, um, and they says how the letting droplets of the fog accumulates and drips down the wind and goes to the mouth. So they use the same design to generate water in the communities where is the where is the water stressed areas. So transition from the traditional to a new electrical grid. Um, on the left, you have the coal and steam industry, and you have the you know tr uh, transducer and, and the power line. On the right, you have the mix and combination of the renewable and then energy storage, and then satellite that communicates to the grid how to distribute the energy and where are the needs. So what has to happen is that public policy has to advance, economics has to advance, and technological innovations that all have driven the rapid rate of change in the electric power systems. So the modern grid is going to be a lot decentralized. So the fact, so next slide, that's okay. So then, uh, then so my early experience in Japan, we started in 90s, the project. So I worked on development of lithium ion batteries, solid oxide fuel cells, proton exchange membranes. This doesn't mean anything to anybody, but all of those technologies are about the lower carbonization and how to improve the green gas house emissions. So one of them are on the 15 is the fuel cells for residential use where we will use the fuel cells to replace the boilers and a lot of science is behind how much of electricity and how much of the heat do you produce. Another one that is circles fuel cells vehicle. I work with the Toyota Motors on development of the catalyst for fuel cells car. Um, so I'm going to talk a little more about fuel cells car, but in Japan, regardless who is the prime minister and one year they had three prime ministers, uh, they have the energy roadmap and that energy roadmap is driven by industry. It's a driven by academic and academic works very closely with industry. So once I graduated from Kyoto University, I didn't post my resume or had a CV. My professor says, you're going to work for Toyota Motors in Japan Fine Ceramic Center. And I asked why I do have to have two jobs. And he says, because you're a foreigner, you cannot go directly to work for Toyota Motors. You can work in national labs, and then you can be seconded to Toyota Motors. So when you are Taiko Kujin in Japan, at that time, there was very ch many challenges. What kind of the jobs can you have? And I was very happy because I had two jobs. So next one, please. So. When we think about the technology and green energy and the hydrogen, we are thinking about new products and what are the problems that the new products are solving. So we think about environmental uh, houses, environmental cars, environmental technologies, environmental or green manufacturing. So I work for solid oxide fuel cells with JFCC to have those to be integral part of the houses. And then I work on development of the fuel cells car at Toyota Motors. So I'm going to show you the fuel cells car, how it works. And the video is going to be played. It's a Toyota CEO and president and chairman. He's now chairman, no longer CEO, Mr. Toyota. And his grandfather started the company. Uh, and he's talking about the fuel cells car. And there are many manufacturers of the fuel cells car. We still don't have enough hydrogen stations and infrastructure in US, but in, in Germany, you have hydrogen trains. They are now going to build from Milan all the way to Berlin. So the hydrogen infrastructure is much more developed in, 
in California. They have 48 stations in Vancouver, in Canada, in British Columbia, but also in Europe. So if we can go to the next slide, and I think it's going to play the video, but it's going to explain to you how the fuel cells work, how the cars looked. And five years ago, I asked Toyota to bring them on campus. I had Moon Choi driving in the car and he enjoyed the experience. So let's hear from Mr. Toyota. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are at a turning point in automobile history. A turning point where people will embrace a new environmentally friendly car that is a pleasure to drive. A turning point where a four-door sedan can travel 300 miles on a single tank of hydrogen, can be refueled in under five minutes, and emit only water vapor. A turning point that represents many years and countless hours of work by our team to create a car that redefines the industry. All of us at Toyota believe in a future that will be safer, greener, and easier for everyone. We imagine a world filled with vehicles that will diminish our dependence on oil and reduce harm to the environment. A bold but inspiring goal, and today it is a reality. Our fuel cell vehicle brands of hydrogen that can be made from virtually anything, even garbage. It has a fuel cell that creates enough electricity to power a house for about a week. This is a car that lets you have it all with no compromises. As a test driver, I knew this new fuel cell vehicle had to be truly fun to drive, and believe me, it is. It has a low center of gravity, which gives it very dynamic handling. After surviving millions of miles on the test track and 10 years of testing on public road, in freezing cold and scorching heat, after passing extensive crash tests, and after working with local government and researchers around the world to help make sure it is easy and convenient to refuel, we're ready to deliver. The name we've given to our new car is Mirai, which in Japanese means future. We believe that behind the wheel of the Mirai, we can go places we have never been to a world that is better, in a car that is better. For us, this isn't just another car. This is an opportunity, an opportunity to really make a difference. And making a difference is what Toyota is all about. The future has arrived, and it's called Mirai. So thank you. You know, I had a great pleasure knowing Mr. Toyota, and he is truly remarkable and very humble person uh, by all means. So I'm going to talk now a little about my research and the role of the green hydrogen and fuel cells and how it integrates. So green hydrogen, hydrogen is the most abandoned element. And if you integrate the wind, solar, and uh, you can supply grid power, by having the hydrogen as a storage. Uh, the biggest issue of unused power when we have a sun is wind, but we don't have the best means to store the energy. So in the, in the fuel cells, the hydrogen, uh, the electricity is produced by bringing the hydrogen uh, on one side of the electrode called cathode and bringing the air to another side of the, uh, here is electrolyzer for production of the hydrogen, bringing the uh, water and splitting the water. So you can use the water to produce the hydrogen and that will be green in the case that it is integrated with the solar and green because to split the water, you need electricity, you need energy. <laughs> and, um, and that's one of the, of the, of the application of the hydrogen in, in that you saw in the fuel cells car, but it's used massively 
in the industry and making semiconductors in cooling systems and many more applications. So this, the strategy and challenges from proton exchange membranes electrolyzer and splitting waters is that the cost is still very high, that we have to reduce significantly catalyst loading, and that we have to use the novel technology to reduce the manufacturing steps in manufacturing the elements that we call the stack. So my group had worked on these six segments. I, I graduated a number of the students. I have many of undergraduate students in my lab. I had exchange students from Italy, Germany being in my lab. And, um, and I still have six uh, graduate students in my lab, although I'm president, but I spend weekend with them. So I spend Mondays, early mornings, and, and I love that time and the experience that I have with them in the lab. So next slide, please. So, <clears throat> Um, so you heard about that I have six patterns that are relating to the manufacturing. So when it comes to manufacturing, manufacturing also has to be green and less energy intensive. And what I'm showing in this picture is how to produce the catalyst as a one step process that you ignite and the process is spontaneous and then you have the good control of the morphology. And for catalyst to have high performance, it has to have high surface area. When you have the high surface area, it's like a grapes. So you have so many atoms on the on the surface, and then you have the high uh, low uh, mass resistance, and then you have the gases uh, being surrounding uh, all the atoms. So this is the structure of the cross section of the of the catalyst and people who are scientists in material science or chemistry, they will understand what I'm talking. But the simple is that you have to control the surface. You have to control the gases flow. You have to control the gases in and gases out, and you have to control the gradation mechanisms in your catalyst. So next slide, please. So when we look at the industry, why technology is not there? Technology is not there because the product is very expensive. For any technology to be adopted, you, it has to be uh, cost comparable to existing technologies, no matter wonders what it does. So what I'm showing on this curve is what is the commercial catalyst? Commercial catalyst has three milligrams of iridium uh, per centimeter square on the anode and three milligrams of platinum. Iridium is these days two times more expensive than platinum, and you know how expensive is platinum. So one of the grants, and I have many papers and many projects in this area, is how to reduce the loadings 10 times without compromising performance. So everything that we do, we compare to commercial baseline, and then we says this is the performance with 10 times less loading that will reduce the cost. Next slide, please. So this is one of the projects that uh, I started four years ago from the Department of Energy, multi-million dollars project, and this is with Proton on site. And this is a company now called Nell that is located in Bellingford in Connecticut, and they produce the hydrogen for the fuel cells car. So for last 15 years, they had been testing fuel cells, uh, Toyota SUV, and later on Mirai at technology demonstration site. And one of the benefits is that you can see that when you go at the station, it's like any gasoline station. You can charge your car with a four kilograms, now five kilograms of compressed hydrogen in less than five minutes. You cannot charge your electrical car to the full capacitance with in, in less than five minutes. And that's a big advantage. And then we have another partner from Florida, Mainstream Engineering, that produced the equipment that allows us in situ diagnostics as we manufacture and scale up the process. Next slide, please. So here is the video that you can play, you can see in my lab. So all the hardware and everything that you see has been built uh, by my students, myself, and machine shop, Mike Drobny. 
So we truly have amazing uh, technicians and staff that can make whatever you dream. And I always get the idea of coming from the manufacturing, how we can manufacture and how that manufacturing can be environmentally friendly. On the right side, you have the slide of the stack. Once when we ensemble to produce the kilograms of the hydrogen, this is how the stack looks. And you have many nodes, and that's because to keep the pressure that this is very pressurized system. You can ask how safe is the hydrogen? Can we catch the fires? And when you hit the, the container with the hydrogen, it is made from the carbon fibers, it's very enforced, but the hydrogen flame shoots up. So there is no explosion like in combustion engines when you have the car crash and then the car are completely in the fire. Next slide, please. So this is the whole process of development that we start and we start with the small cells. It's a, a lot of, of fundamental knowledge in the transport phenomena understanding the kinetics, understanding the ohmic resistance, mass transport, and I'm showing the small stack that we developed three years ago, and then the scale-up process to 680 centimeters squared. So if we go back to Mirai and the hydrogen, uh, Mirai has two hydrogen tanks with three-layer structure made of the carbon fibers and reinforced plastics. And that is from the safety perspective. It's very light and we can run. So in the video, Mr. Toyota, this video was done 10 years ago. We can go now with 360 miles for four kilograms. And now the tank is designed that you can compress and have 5.6 kilograms of fuel. So you can recharge 5.6 kilograms for less than five minutes. And now you can go over 500 miles. And that's a benefit of the fuel cell scar. So when we compare uh, of the range that you can drive, hydrogen cars are a winner. But hydrogen cars do not have the infrastructure uh, as a as electrical car. And the electrical car have the range extenders, and they and they put the range of extenders to give you extra miles. And there is the and there is much more intense extensive charging infrastructure that is present in our country and in many other countries in Europe you have Teslas as well and then there is battery exchange programs so from many perspective electrical are still winners but if you think of the range uh, electrical cannot be fuel cell scar next slide please so why. So I'm going to go back to physics and go and talk about energy density versus specific energy. So there is theoretical limits how far you can go with the lithium ions and fuel cells can give you more. Why? Hydrogen used in the fuel cells has energy to weight ratio 10 times greater than lithium ion batteries. And it offers much greater range while being lighter and occupying sm smaller volumes. So if the infrastructure is the present, if technology can compete in the market, then we are going to have both solutions. One is lithium ion batteries, one is the fuel cells. But that time is still not there. I think Toyota sold about 28,000 cars in, in California. I remember 10 years ago when uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, former governor, was buying and testing and, uh, and some celebrities. Uh, my friends and people that I work in Vancouver, many of them have fuel cells car. They are enjoying, they said it's significant. We have two hydrogen stations in Connecticut, but it's still not enough. Next slide, please. So what is enough? So I traveled with governor Lamont and I had been meeting him intensively and he says, Radenka, you are all about green hydrogen and I'm air. And I says, governor, we make a perfect fuel cells. So one side air, one side hot air, one side hydrogen. So, but what governor Lamont done, uh, and it was announced on March 24th, that is going to be multi-state coalition uh, and to pursue 8 billion federal infrastructure law funding available to start four regional hubs 
to expand the use of the clean hydrogen. So, and um, we are partnering with New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts to put that large $2 billion proposal. Next slide, please. So, that brings me to my last slide. Um, thanks to COVID, I was able to sit down and have a little more presence and finish my book that I was writing for five years on the solid oxide fuel cells from the fundamental principle to complete system. I had uh, help from my student who, who, who was my postdoc. He's uh, no longer uh, with us, but he now works for the for the company down in Florida, and we have joint projects sponsored by the Department of Energy, where we use the seawater to produce the hydrogen. Um, I want to finish with a book on Vannevar Bush. Uh, this is the, there are many editions of this book, and the science, the endless frontier. So I think the future is truly in inventing and reinventing the way that we think and the way that we see the things. I truly believe that climate change is a real. I didn't change my position from my early in 90s to now. Um, I see uh, many more storms and I know it is going to be more. And I think in order to leave the world a better place and for opportunity to make difference, we cannot harm environments and we have to work with nature in the harmony. So with that, I'm I'm going to thank you all for being today with us. Uh, Yukon is a great place where a lot of innovation happens and I'm more than happy to answer any of the questions that you might have related to any topics besides politics. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. You can unmute and, and clap or, you know, hit the icon, whichever that you want to do, you know, snap it up, snap it up. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. That's exciting. <laughs> Think of that. That is exciting. Um, you know, for my 10 year station on in, in the Navy, I was stationed on submarines for six years and we were able to stay underwater for three months at a time because we separated the H2O. We kept the O2 on the submarine and in, in banks and we actually pushed the, the hydrogen off off mm -hmm. of the off of the submarine. So I knew a little bit of something about this technology because you had to you had to be trained on all the systems on the on the submarine. But this this work that you're doing is incredibly incredibly exciting. I'm sure there are a million questions out there, so I don't want to talk too long. If you have a question, I can't see you all, so uh, please just unmute if you can and uh, and, and ask uh, your question. Jump on in. Um, you might interrupt somebody because we can't see each other, but that's okay. We're all family here. We're all friends here, so you know, let's just, let's just do that. I, I will kick in right away and say I love the first slide or the second slide that came up that said education is a passport to becoming a global citizen. And when I see the different positions and the places where you have gone to school around the world, I think it is a way to open the mind and the imagination to what are the what are the possibilities. And I'm curious, I'll start us off with the first question. Um, I'm, I'm already thinking beyond the vehicle. I mean, that's already exciting, but beyond that, what other applications could you see? I mean, the gentleman said, Mr. Toyota said, you could you could um, fuel a house, right? You could supply the energy for a house for about, I forget how long he said, but- Seven it, you days, know. seven days. So if you can think you can have decentralized power. So if we can envision tomorrow that we can build a house on any cliff and then we come and we don't need uh, wires, you know, and we don't depend on the ever source. Of course, we will always depend on them. But if you can, your car becomes generator. So if you come with the 5.6 kilograms of the hydrogen, you can power your house and not a mansion, but the house that is like 2,000 square feet size for seven days. And that would be amazing, you know, from the, so people will say, how will you do that in the mountain? And one thing that he said, we can produce hydrogen from garbage. Uh, so this video was made 10 years ago when Elon Musk came out and he says, 
my car and Tesla are the future and fuel cells car are the garbage. And after that, you know, Mr. Toyota says, yes, we can produce hydrogen. From the <laughs> and the way that you do it, you know, I did experiment with our students at Depot Campus. So my lab is at Depot Campus and I have on trailer the gasifier. So mm -hmm. I collect uh, at campus chicken poo, uh, poo uh, uh, you know, waste, uh, uh, waste, diving hole waste, the grease, make the pellets with my students and I produce, I burn it and pro actually I don't burn it. I do the partial pyrolysis and then I produce the sink gas. <laughs> and that sink gas has about 40% on the hydrogen. So I separate the hydrogen, I separate CO2. You bring the CO2 to greenhouses, you can gr uh, grow the peppers, and the rest I power them over to demonstrate how you can do it. You know, so Lovely. you can really go from the garbage, especially uh, wood garbage, wood chips, and you can mm -hmm. pyrolyze that and produce the hydrogen. So um, when we think about technologies, we always think of the end product. What we don't think enough about sustainability and raw materials. And mm -hmm. one thing that I tell people about lithium ion batteries, that main component is the cathode is a cobalt. And there are limited resources of the cobalt. And the one, the biggest one is in Africa. And when you start using and, and, and um, depleting the areas of the cobalt or using too much water that is used now for agriculture, for mm -hmm. extracting the lithium, you are going to create a social uh, social disturbance to those areas. Mm -hmm. and, and that is very, we have to think of the politics, resources, stabilities, and how we create injustice. And, and, and you know, polluting the China with, with, with waste, with waste cell phones, with the, you know, not being able to recycle or recycle enough it creates another kind of the problems. So mm -hmm. when we think of the of the solution, we have to take the whole ecosystem in our minds, you know, poverty, uh, the rights to happiness, uh, the, the water, the basic human needs that we cannot advance one nation and make another nation to suffer. Mm -hmm. so, so I learned a lot, you know, to think about uh, democracy and what democracy means and what the happiness means for everybody. Um, and one thing that I didn't share with you, when I was a student in Japan, I learned that uh, Connecticut is a birthplace of the fuel cells. So in 1969, <laughs> Connecticut put men on the moon and that will not happen without the fuel cells. So the Apollo shuttle was running on the fuel cells produced by United Technology Power, and they produced electricity and water for crews. So, Michael, very similar to your experience on submarine. So if we go to museum, you can see the first fuel cells made by Connecticut. And that's when I learned first time about the fuel cells in Connecticut. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Amazing. All right, folks, don't be shy because I can bogart this entire conversation. So don't be shy, please, sir. Donald. Renka, tell me, is there the political will? You speak to the governor. What's he saying? Can we get something at scale? To get, we need the population to start moving and nobody's making that first step. You know, uh, when I lived in Canada, uh, it was called Hydrogen Highway. Uh, and Hydrogen Highway was from uh, San Diego to Whistler. So in 2010, we have uh, Winter Olympics that transported the, you know, so many people only on fuel cells buses. So in, in California, it has been done. University of Irvine and many other places are the center where these things are happening. They have the hydrogen stations. So I talked to governor about how do we expand the Yukon infrastructure? We have electrolyzer and we can produce our own hydrogen. I'm in conversation with Toyota Motors. Can they give us the bus and fuel cars that we can have them at Yukon that people can see, that our students can see how serious we are? So we bring the portfolio of the technology, electrical charges, electrical car, fuel cells car, but that 28% 
of the pollution is done by transportation. We cannot discontinue our, our power plant, although it emits green gases, because we, we simply cannot produce enough power to meet our needs. We will be many days in dark if we go that way. But there are the things that we can do tomorrow, and that is the transportation. Uh, how governor me thinks, when I was with him in Israel, he says, uh, he asked people at Tachyon, and he says, oh my goodness, Radenka is just talking about green hydrogen, green hydrogen storage, energy decentralized. He says, how far is the technology from today? Is it 20, 30 years from now? And they says, governor, it's happening today. <laughs> and it's happening in other parts of the world. And you can see our trip in Israel was in February. Now in March, he issued that he's willing to collaborate with the governors because now there is infrastructure bill uh, from federal government, 8 billion, and their competition is open. So we cannot do it alone. So as California done from San Diego to uh, uh, Whistler, we have to do from Washington to Maine. And, and we are writing that kind of the proposal. So the technology is there, but infrastructure is not there. Wow. There was an interesting right. article, uh, I believe it was in the New York Times business section, uh, that the Rio, the fuel cell, uh, the immediate uh, future is in uh, long distance uh, tractor trailer uh, usage because of the ability uh, to go 500 miles uh, on one tank and fill it up in, in five minutes. Uh, and uh, so th there was a, a, a very serious article about that's where uh, the fuel cell is initially being uh, directed. Thank you, Coleman. There is a company called Nikola in US that's recruited over 200 people from Tesla who are now working on the fuel cells tracks. And these companies receives a lot of funding um, and there are many others. So it's not, but you know, if you think in Germany of the hydrogen trains, you know, there are the models there. Um, for us, the difficulty in US is the, depending, you know, who, what is the vision in Washington DC that things can happen and things can lose the focus. You know, and uh, in Europe, they take it seriously. It is supported to um, different frameworks, framework six, seven, eight, uh, Horizon 2000. Uh, but there is a lot of investment because they know that's the only way that we can mitigate and address the climate change. So the renewable has to be significant part of the portfolio. And that's what I showed about by 2050, 28% of the uh, energy will be for coming from sustainable or renewable. So um, the cost is still very expensive and that's why there's this less appetite in US because if the car costs 80,000, uh, people are thinking twice to buy, but infrastructure also has to be in place. In Canada, they sell fuel cells car for 56,000. Wow. Wow. Um, uh, Radenka, we have a question in the chat from uh, a fellow distinguished professor von Hammerstein. She asks, having lived in so many different cultures, did you experience differences in approaches to preserving nature? I'm not talking about uh, better or worse, but different. Yes, I did. So uh, when I was a child, I grew up in Austria. So I work, I lived in apartment house. And we have the laundry room uh, and everybody use the laundry room and we have the meters for expensive and cheap electricity. And since I know my name or for myself and my existence, we have the recycling. So we will have transparent glass. We will have the color gas. We will have the food. We will have the wood and we will go and put in the beans into the containers. So when I move in Japan, it was the same way. When I moved down to Atlanta, I asked my neighbors, when is the recycling day? How we recycle newspaper, glass, metals? And they said, <laughs> you know, so, so it was quite a cultural shock, the way how we think, because one thing that we don't think is that we have to change our behavior. And, and 
you know, the behavior in Europe and behavior in Japan is, is very different when it comes to consumptions and energy. Um, you know, and I always joke uh, in German, the, I see the Catherine, but, uh, you know, the most favorable world is sparen, sparen. So we sparen everything, you know, from the money to the way how we think, how we cook, how we consume the energy, how we, how we live. So every culture has a, has a different approach uh, to how to build environmentally friendly and how to consume, how to recycle. And, and how to think of different impacts and, and applications. So um, it's just simply different, you know, and I think we have more innovations in US because there is a lot of distraction, a lot of chaos, people come all over the world to succeed. So although it looks, God help us how we can succeed, we are successful um, in more, um, in, in the cultures that have the longer history, like Japan, like uh, Switzerland or Austria, the things are different. Uh, so I'm not saying better or worse, but it's very different. So. My goodness. All right. Um, if there's a hand out there, I have another one more question in the chat from George, uh, and that's how do you produce hydrogen on a large scale in the West Texas wind farms during off peak hours? Uh, you know, we have, we have like large, you can, you can do from the hydropower, you can do from the natural gas, you know, you can, uh, the most of the hydrogen is still uh, produced by reforming the natural gas, but you can, you can have the huge system. So if you look this company that I mentioned in Wellingford, they have now the huge capacity of, of producing the hydrogen. So if you integrate the hydrogen, if you integrate electrolyzers with the wind and with the solar, you the systems are now getting bigger and bigger. So you can have the units and, and produce. It. So there is no there is no issue now with the scaling. But there is an issue with the cost. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and that is limitation. So that's why they still most of it is is produced uh, from uh, from natural gas. But one of the solution will be if we can use the seawater because the seawater then you don't have to purify. You will have less components, and if the material can produce this from the seawater, then you will be able to have a lot of storage. And and what you want when you have the solar and wind, you want to store that that energy and release when it's demand. Because the difficulties now with integrating renewable is the fluctuation of the grid. The grid cannot take that fluctuation. Mm, thank goodness for seawater. Um, fantastic, fantastic. Any other, any other questions? Any other questions out there? You can put it in the chat or you can simply unmute and ask the question. All right, all right. Well, it has been an absolutely wonderful conversation. Uh, President Merrick, it's so good to have you. Uh, congratulations once again on being a distinguished professor at the University of Connecticut. Uh, we certainly appreciate you. Uh, everybody snap it up, clap it up. You know, it was a great conversation. We really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, it was informative and it was fun. It was certainly very fun. All right. Everybody, good Thank to have you, you here. All. Thank you and, for joining us. And I want to really acknowledge amazing talents of the faculties and staff and students that we have at UConn. And I know that there is more excellent faculties that deserve to be recognized. So I'm really honored to, to be recognized by Board of Trustees. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, we appreciate you joining us on a on a Tuesday. Um, have a wonderful evening, and we will see you the next time. Once again, President Merrick, thank you again. All right, all. Take care. Take care. Have fun. Have fun. <laughs> <laughs>